Hey guys, this is Derek Duplessy, host of Purpose Rockstar. It's a podcast where we interview people who found purpose in their career in all kinds of fields. Welcome to the Purpose Rockstar Podcast, inspiring stories of people who found purpose in their careers five days a week. Unleash your inner rock star and tap into your highest purpose with your host, Derek Duplessy. Welcome to the Purpose Rockstar Podcast. I'm your host, Derek Duplessy, Executive Director of the Duplessy Foundation. We're helping inner city entrepreneurs to pursue their purpose by training them to run a successful business. This show is an extension of our mission to help you and people all over the world find purpose in their work. Let me tell you a little bit about today's guest. Today's interview is with Sarah Seeger. Not only is she a good friend, but she's also one of the most well-known astrophysicists in the world. You'll see her all over the place in Ancient Aliens or on the Star Trek DVD. She's everywhere. But, you know, in this interview, you actually get to understand the person behind all of the science. And I think you really will enjoy this. Purpose rock stars, let's do this. Sarah Seeger, are you ready to rock? I am. Beautiful. Well, Sarah, we know each other for, you know, for a long time, and we can sort of go down memory lane a little bit. And we're going to go through your journey, your story, um, starting out in Toronto and now being a, a preeminent astrophysicist. We're going to talk about what you're doing now, and we're going to have a lightning round where I ask you a series of quick questions, and you're going to give awesome answers. But before we do any of those things... I'd love to get a quote that means something to you. Great. Okay. Let me think. Well, I mean, Derek, I've got so many quotes I really love. The one that sticks with my mind today is one, if there's a will, there's a way. And I really like that because so often we're faced with, no, you can't do that. It often comes from the outside. But many of us inside, we have an inner voice that always believes we can do it, but we're kind of being shut down from the outside. So I love that quote because it means that if you believe you can do it and you have the will to do something, you will be able to find a way. Beautiful. Well, I know that in your story that's going to be a thread. So let's transition into that. Give us, you know, five minutes or so on your story. How did you go from uh, a girl growing up in Toronto to one of the preeminent astrophysicists in the world? Well, there's it's a lot to summarize in five minutes, Derek, but I'll start with my uh, wonder of the night sky and my fortune of being born into a family where I had a father who really, 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 really looked out for me. He wanted his children to be exposed to many concepts and ideas, and as a small child, I remember him taking me to see the stars. It was called a star party, and that's not, unfortunately, where the Hollywood stars get together. In any event, a five-year-old probably wouldn't care about the Hollywood stars, but a star party is where amateur astronomers get together with their telescopes, even in a city, when the skies are kind of polluted. And the amateur astronomers set up their telescopes and advertise for any random people to come by and take a look. So my dad took me to one of these as a child, and I just remember seeing the moon through a telescope. And I hope all the listeners can find a chance to do that, because I'll tell you what, it is absolutely breathtaking. You would have no idea what structures you can see on the moon, even with a small telescope. And I have a series of memories like that of the sky, although they weren't really meaningful memories until much later on. And so as I went through my life, um, my father also encouraged me to be super independent. And so uh, one day I learned, I'm skipping over things rapidly, obviously, Um, So as I grew up, I did many different things. In many ways, I was a typical child. I came from a broken home. My mother remarried. I had all the problems and more that a lot of people have. But ultimately, I went through. I did the whole teenage phase of partying and other things. And then one day, I got serious again. I wanted to go to university, and I knew I had to start focusing on my grades. So I started studying again, and I became so serious and nerdy that all the party people dropped me. 
So it was around that time that I went to the open house at my university because I was more focused on, you know, my future. I drop into the open house and I found out you can be an astronomer for a job. And I, you know what? That is one of the best days of my entire life. And I rushed home and I told my dad. And then I got the longest lecture almost that I'd ever had from him, the harshest lecture. And he lectured me for about two hours. All he did was say, Sarah, you need to get a job where you can support yourself and not rely on any man. And he kind of went over and over. He didn't think I could get a job doing what I loved doing. It just didn't seem like something reasonable to him. But because he had brought me up to be independent, um, I mean, at the time, I thought, okay, I probably have to change my mind now. I didn't really know what to do. But by and by, I went to university, did well, and then I ended up deciding that it was better just to do what I loved, regardless of what the risks were. Beautiful. And tell us a little bit about so your journey as an academic and how you got to MIT. Well, in my, I went to undergraduate, and I just took all the science classes in my first year because I wasn't sure what I was going to do. I wasn't sure what field I would end up in. My father wanted me to be a doctor and to go to pre-med. But I, I have a really terrible memory, so I couldn't remember anything. So that was kind of out. Physics is better because you can derive things. We say derive from first principles, but it means you write down something basic, like you'll be familiar with E equals MC squared, or we have a lot of other formula like that that you write down and you just go from there. You can kind of follow it all logically. So I did my undergraduate, and I, I actually, in my university, they had an observatory called the David Dunlap Observatory. It's now run by amateur astronomers, but at the time it was still kind of winding down, but in its professional phase, and I got to do a summer internship there. They offered a summer internship where they pay you sort of minimal, and you work there. And I did work, and I loved working on that. And then I eventually, I, when I decided what I was going to do, I applied to grad schools in many places, and I got into Harvard. I went to Harvard. And although initially I didn't like grad school, I wasn't really happy there, something awesome happened when I was there, and that is exoplanets were discovered orbiting sun-like stars. For the first time ever, humans had found that there are planets that orbit stars like the sun, but are some distance away from us. For the first time ever, astronomers had found that there are planets that orbit stars other than the sun, and that happened right when I was in grad school. So my advisor at the time said if I wanted to work on that, I could, and it seemed pretty exciting and cool. So I started working on that. And to make a long story short, the rest is history. Beautiful. And uh, just to follow up, you're one of the sort of younger people um, to, to rise to prominence in astrophysics. Um, talk about how you sort of got to where you are in such a quick manner. Right. Well, now we'll dive into that. The rest is history thing. So what happened <laughs> when I, worked on, when I wor started working on this, it was a really interesting time because it ties back to where there's a will, there's a way. People told me, don't work on this. This is nothing. It's going nowhere. Those signals people have found, they're not planets. They're just another astrophysical phenomenon. And let me explain it for a second because it's kind of important. Well, most of the planets that were found initially, all of them, in fact, we didn't see the planet at all. Seeing the planet directly is still really in our future, except for a handful of cases. What we people saw was, we call it the wobble of the star. Imagine that the planet and star are orbiting their common center of mass. People like to say the planet is tugging on the star. That's not really accurate, but you can think of it that way for simplicity. Planet tugging on the star as it orbits the star and the star moves. So you just see the star move, and you infer the presence of a planet. Well, it's our job in science to be skeptical, but people were so skeptical in sometimes quite a nasty way. And they said, no, it could be the star pulsating. Maybe the star is expanding and contracting in a new way that we haven't seen before, because we know that some stars do pulsate. And so there's all this controversy. And my thesis wasn't even just on discovering planets. It was on computer models to study their atmospheres. So, you know, if people didn't believe the planets were real, they sure didn't believe we could ever study their atmospheres, which is a much, much smaller effect than anything that was measured at the time. So there's sort of this level of skepticism, but I wasn't really committed to a future in science. I was a risk taker by nature, and so I just stuck with it. And that actually ended up helping me get ahead because no one else was working on this. Very few people in the world were working on the topic that I was working on. And I was able to uh, move forward kind of on my own steam in my own way, in my own little world, before the work became really highly relevant. That was one thing. The second thing was, and the advice I always give to people is, Find something you love doing, but that you're also really, really good at. That's very important because it takes, it takes a long time, and some people never get to have an intersection between those. Some people never get to find an overlap because there's lots of things people love doing, 
And I believe that everybody has a set of things they're really good at, but often they don't match. <laughs> but if they do match, you know it's a winner. And it turned out I was just really good at um, not, not just sort of the math and physics part, but the creativity part, thinking of what we should do next, how to make things work, uh, what our future could be in a very specific field of science. And so those two things together are what really helped. Beautiful. That, you know, well, that's not all the story. It's all the rest of the generic career advice. Get out there and network. <laughs> people talk to them. But I did all that without even really realizing I was doing it. And that was, um, you know, I took every opportunity that came my way. I was big. Like every time I got an invitation to give a talk or do something, I took every single one of them. So I made, I made that. So I made a big effort. Now I get way too many invitations when I turn them all down. But at the time, I knew what I had to do. You know there's more to that interview? Yeah, more. And you can find all of it at PurposeRockstar.com. The link is right there. Yeah, right there. Yeah, right there. So it's really, really awesome that you can go to PurposeRockstar.com. If you're one of those on-the-go Apple people, you can check it out on iTunes. There's the link. And for my non-Apple people, I'm going to make sure there's a link on Stitcher somewhere next to me. So you got iTunes, Stitcher, and PurposeRockstar.com. Tell your friends. Tell your family. We're on Twitter and Facebook, and somehow we'll be on LinkedIn. I don't know. But at least we'll be on Twitter and Facebook. And one final favor. Pursue your purpose. It needs you. You know, we're all really limited by our own internal problems. And you have to be brave and harsh with yourself and try to recognize what those limitations are and then work to overcome them.